Korea has been a battleground of the Cold War almost since the start of the Cold War itself. The peninsula is divided in half, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea in the north and the Republic of Korea in the south, separated by the demilitarized zone, the DMZ, one of the world's most heavily fortified borders. In previous episodes looking at Korea, we have looked at the development of North Korea after 1953, as well as several episodes looking at post-war South Korea. We are going to bring some of these threads back together today, looking at the increasingly strained relations that by the late 1960s almost saw a resumption of all-out war. I'm your host David, and today we are going to look at the Korean DMZ conflict, the assassination attempt on President Park Chung-hee, and the infamous USS Pueblo incident. This is the Cold War. The world can be a really busy place, which can make it difficult to have your voice really heard. These are your opinions and your ideas, which is why I am so glad to have discovered the sponsor of today's video, YouGov. YouGov lets me take surveys and polls on all kinds of subjects, from politics to products to pop culture, and I get to earn cash and gift cards while I do it. YouGov is free to join, and as a member, you earn points just by giving your actual opinions that matter. I like to fill in surveys while I'm taking a break from reading and studying about the Cold War, and then with the gift cards I've earned from YouGov, I buy more books about the Cold War. It really is a great side hustle. I know that you want to earn cash and gift cards too just by sharing your opinions, so click on our link in the description and sign up for YouGov today. In 1953, the two Korean republics signed an uneasy armistice that brought an end to three years of devastating conflict, but there were still many loose ends. Both states claimed ownership of the entire peninsula, so just like in Highlander, in the end there could only be one. At the time, the DPRK was the stronger of the two Koreas, both in terms of its economic and military strength, so the dream of unification was seen as much more realistic and attainable for the leaders of the Communist North. Although Kim Il-sung had failed to take over the South by means of a direct approach, that is, an all-out invasion, there were other avenues that could be taken to achieve his goal. In December 1962, based on his own guerrilla warfare experiences fighting the Japanese and then mixed with Maoist ideas, Kim proposed a new military approach revolving around irregular warfare. But this was a radical departure from the Soviet-style doctrine that had been in place for years, something the army would need time to change, and besides, the country was in the middle of the seven-year plan, so any action against the South would have to wait until 1967. However, developments in South Korea led to Kim Il-sung shifting his timeline forward. For starters, under President Park Chung-hee, not only did the ROK's economy begin to recover from the turgid inefficiency and corruption of the Rhee years, but the Third Republic had also started to expand its diplomatic ties as signaled by the 1965 trade agreement with Japan. But that was the same year in which a golden opportunity presented itself to Kim Il-sung and his military staff. The United States had entered the Vietnam War, and as a bonus, Uncle Sam had brought ROK troops with him to Vietnam. With a significant part of South Korean forces being on an expedition thousands of miles away from their homeland, and with the American attention turned elsewhere, this was deemed the perfect moment for the North to implement its new strategy in another attempt to take over the Korean Peninsula. The overall strategy called for small teams of men, no more than 12 people, who were highly trained and lightly armed. These teams, usually equipped with only submachine guns and some demolition charges, would infiltrate across the DMZ to create havoc in the rear of the ROK troops stationed along the border. On the south side of the DMZ, preventing infiltration of North Korean forces was not an easy task. Surveillance equipment was not as advanced as today, fortifications in the DMZ were not allowed, and the doctrinal void on the American South Korean side was certainly not helping either. Simply put, the two allies were more than prepared to face an all-out invasion, a standard war where the opponent played by the rules and moved a conventional army forward in an all-out attack. They were baffled as to how to respond to this limited warfare strategy. 
General Bonnesteel, commander of the United States Forces Korea at the time, addressed the DPRK tactics by developing a four-layer defense along the demilitarized zone. This was first implemented in the sectors covered by the U.S. 2nd Infantry Division and the ROK 21st Division, and then gradually expanded to cover the entirety of the DMZ. These new defensive measures included a more aggressive patrol system, new barriers, and upgraded the fortifications of the existing outposts to include machine guns and recoilless rifles, which actually consisted a breach of the terms of the armistice. There was also a quick reaction force formed consisting of mechanized infantry and tanks tasked with rapidly deploying to locations where infiltrators were spotted. But the mission of North Korean soldiers often didn't stop at just crossing the border and killing a few patrolling ROK troops. In addition to their special training in guerrilla warfare, they were also political agitators, with a mission to instigate a full-scale insurgency in the south using the Taebak and Jirisan Mountains as a stronghold. By late 1967, when this strategy became apparent to President Park Chung-hee and General Bonnesteel, they developed a new counterinsurgency strategy, with South Korea even creating eight new special anti-insurgency battalions. Despite the United States and South Korea adopting these new measures, the influx of infiltrating North Korean troops couldn't be stopped. The list of violent episodes across the DMZ is huge. In 1967 alone, there were more than 400 incidents. We hardly have the time or ability to look at all of these, so we're going to look at the two most important of these incidents, the assassination attempt on President Park Chung-hee and the capture of the USS Pueblo. Okay, assassination first. President Park had just been re-elected to office and, having stabilized the South Korean economy, was working towards future growth. Now, a stable regime in South Korea was a serious detriment to Kim Il-sung's plan to creating a large-scale rebellion in the South. People who are economically and politically stable don't tend to overthrow their governments, after all. Additionally, 1967 saw the United States being drawn deeper into the war in Vietnam, so if there was a time for the great leader to gamble on all-out war, it was then. 31 men were handpicked from the elite Unit 124 and were put through a rigorous training regime that would make any commando blush with shame. Included in the training was the construction of a mock-up of the Korean presidential house, the Blue House, where the recruits spent two weeks training for and rehearsing their plan. The 17th of January marked the beginning of the operation as they changed into Republic of Korea uniforms and began crossing the DMZ along the sector held by the U.S. 2nd Infantry Division. Moving carefully, it took the commandos two days to cross the four-kilometer-wide zone, but on the evening of the 19th, they stumbled on a group of South Korean woodcutters. Seeming to abandon all military logic, the commandos, having detained the woodcutters for a while, made the decision to free them. This proved to be a fatal mistake, as the woodcutters promptly went to the police, who then alerted the South Korean counter guerrilla squads, who moved to high alert. The tight defenses around Seoul did not seem to discourage the North Korean commandos, who entered the city on the night of the 20th and made their final preparations. Using the ROK uniforms they had brought with them, they managed to pass unnoticed until around 10 p.m. when they reached a checkpoint less than 100 meters from the Blue House. There, they were stopped by police chief Choi Gyushik, who began to question them in order to validate their identities. As their lies failed to convince him, Gyushik drew his gun but was immediately shot by the commandos and a firefight between the North Korean soldiers and the South Koreans' men in the checkpoint ensued. The battle, although fierce, was rather short-lived as the North Koreans dispersed, leaving behind two of their dead comrades. An immediate manhunt for the runaway infiltrators began, which would last well over a week and would result in the almost complete liquidation of the North Korean unit. Of the 31 men who initially crossed the DMZ, only two survived. Kim shin jo who was captured, and Pak Jae-gyong, who managed to escape back to the north. In the south, 26 Koreans, including some civilians, as well as four Americans, lost their lives. The attempt on Park Chung-hee's life had failed spectacularly, but while the US and South Korean troops were hunting down the fleeing commandos, another incident occurred, adding even more oil to the already burning fire. This was the capture of an American ship, the USS Pueblo. 
The USS Pueblo had been laid down in 1944, originally as cargo ship FP-344 for use by the US Army, but was used to train civilians in its post-war career. By the mid-1960s, there was a growing need for lower-cost SIGINT collection vessels, so FP-344 was refit as a Banner-class environmental research ship named the USS Pueblo. In reality, the ship was loaded with signals intelligence gathering equipment designed to sail in close proximity to a target country's shores, collecting as much signals data as possible. She was lightly armed and lacked high-capacity burn barrels or even scuttling charges due to a lack of funding. Pueblo had left her base in Yokosuka, Japan earlier in January 1968 with a mission to intercept signals from North Korea. In order to do so, Pueblo would have to patrol the North Korean coastline, moving north to south and back again, though it would remain scrupulously in international waters. A fly in this ointment, however, was that the North Koreans claimed a 50 nautical mile maritime boundary rather than the internationally accepted 12 nautical miles that USS Pueblo was ordered to strictly observe. She was no more than one mile from that border when, the day after the failed Blue House raid, a North Korean submarine chaser approached Pueblo, challenging the nationality of the ship, and later ordering the crew to surrender or be fired upon. The American vessel tried to escape, but in a resulting chase, four North Korean torpedo boats, a second submarine chaser, and even two MiG-21s joined in, leaving no hope for the crew of the Pueblo. The ship tried to outmaneuver her hunters and signaled for help, while the crew raced to destroy as much of their already gathered intelligence as possible, as well as disabling the SIGINT gathering equipment, all sensitive material that could betray the ship's true mission. And despite 7th Fleet Command being fully aware of the unfolding situation, help could not make it in time as a result of no suitable aircraft being available to intervene. The Pueblo was on her own. Eventually, the crew was forced to comply with the demands of their pursuers and followed the North Korean vessels, but stopped just outside DPRK waters in an effort to gain more time to destroy crucial evidence. Sadly, this action provoked the North Koreans to resume firing on the ship, leading to the death of one sailor, Dwayne Hodges. Afterwards, the ship was boarded and the crew taken captive by the North Korean authorities. The fate of the 82 men now rested in the hands of diplomats. As you might imagine, the initial American reactions to the incident were far from calm. Ideas ranged from blockading the port of Wonsan, where Pueblo had been taken, to launching air raids and even a nuclear war threat. President Johnson and his administration eventually decided against any such extreme reaction as a declaration or ultimatum of war, but they did agree that a show of force was necessary and so a massive naval and air force deployment was ordered to the region. Codenamed Operation Formation Star and Operation Combat Fox, the United States managed to marshal around 35 major surface vessels, including six aircraft carriers and as many as 600 airplanes. We should also note here that at the same time they were doing this, the US military was simultaneously having to contend with the Tet Offensive, which had been launched at the very end of January across South Vietnam. This actually makes the concentration of such a large force in Korea and the Sea of Japan all the more impressive. Naturally, the massing of military forces drew the attention and ire of Moscow, who on the 3rd of February made a public demand of President Johnson to reduce the buildup of forces in the area. Keep in mind though, that at the same time through private channels, Brezhnev assured the US that they had no intention of getting themselves involved. In the end, however, it was the pen and not the sword that would eventually set the men of USS Pueblo free as negotiations for their release began in February at Panmunjom. Oddly enough, although maybe not surprising, these meetings did not include the South Koreans, a move which alienated them and ultimately forced the US to send representatives to soothe President Park. From their side, the North Koreans were not very eager to release the captured sailors. At the same time that the diplomats were trying to come to a mutual understanding, the North Korean guards at POW camps were systematically torturing the crewmen of the Pueblo to obtain information. The captain of the ship, Commander Lloyd Mark Butcher, was even put through a mock firing squad in order to make him confess. 
An official confession finally came from the U.S. who admitted that the Pueblo was indeed spying and assured the North Korean government that no such action would be taken against them again in the future. Kim Il-sung, satisfied, allowed the 82 crewmen to return home. On the 23rd of December, after spending 11 months in captivity, the sailors crossed the Bridge of No Return, carrying with them the body of the late Dwayne Hodges. Their captivity and the Pueblo incident was over, but the implications caused by the seizure of the ship went deeper. As we already know, the USS Pueblo was a SIGINT collection ship, a spy ship. As such, it was loaded with plenty of cryptographic and communications devices along with their manuals. Through reverse engineering the equipment found on board the USS Pueblo, North Korea and subsequently the Soviet Union gained access to some of the US Navy's communication systems, at least for a short time. In fact, although unbeknownst at the time, the seizure of the vessel had come at a very timely moment, right after John Anthony Walker, a US Navy officer, had turned spy for the Soviets. In light of that information, people speculated whether the two incidents were connected, with academic opinion still divided, as Soviet documents reveal the USSR had no prior knowledge of the North Korean attacks. In fact, it seems that Kim Il-sung's actions were primarily encouraged instead by the Chinese, who had promised to support North Korea should war on the Korean Peninsula be renewed. Indeed, the Pueblo incident and North Korean aggression in general drove a wedge between Pyongyang and Moscow, with Brezhnev publicly denouncing North Korea's actions. By contrast, Beijing's supportive stance mended the frayed relations between China and North Korea, which had followed the Sino-Soviet split, and helped to move Pyongyang further into the Chinese sphere of influence. The capture of USS Pueblo is often considered to be the height of the Korean DMZ conflict, but it was by no means the end of it. In the months that followed, American and South Korean land defenses were strengthened, making an assault across the DMZ virtually impossible. Different strategies would be tested, and Pyongyang would even gamble on an amphibious assault in Gangwon. But by the end of the year, it became apparent to the North that unconventional operations would not yield the desired outcome. The chances of igniting an insurgency in the South were close to zero, as the population stood behind Park Chung-hee's regime, and despite some speed bumps along the way, US-South Korean relations remained strong, if not even stronger than before. Over the course of the following year, the conflict gradually de-escalated until the release of three captured US soldiers on the 3rd of December 1967, an event which is regarded as the DMZ conflict's symbolic end. Except for one remaining prisoner who remains to this day patiently waiting repatriation. That is the USS Pueblo itself, the second oldest commissioned US vessel and the only one currently being held captive. Anchored in the Pothong River in Pyongyang, she is now a tourist attraction for the people of Pyongyang at North Korea's Victorious War Museum, a lasting piece of memorabilia of the Cold War. We hope you've enjoyed this episode, and to make sure you don't miss all of our future episodes, be sure to like and subscribe and press the bell button, even if you have to cross the most heavily fortified strip of territory on the planet to do so. Please consider supporting us on Patreon at patreon.com slash thecoldwar, or through YouTube membership. We can be reached via email at thecoldwarchannel at gmail.com. This is the Cold War Channel, and as we think about the Cold War, please remember that history is shades of grey and rarely black and white.